And um, uh, we're going to look at uh, 2 John verses 7 through 9 tonight, and we're going to have some prayer time, and Donna and Terry are watching, and um, so let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters tonight who are here with me and who are watching online, and we pray for each and every one. Thank you, grateful for each and every one. And so, Lord, be with us as we open up your word. Give us your spirit that he would teach us, and Father, give us your spirit who would help us to pray. And so, Lord, thank you for all your blessings and goodness. Be with us, Father. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. All right, so Jane's watching. Hello, Jane. Good to hear from you. And another Jane and, and Dave are watching, and we're glad that they're all there. So tonight we're, we're going to look at uh, uh, 2 John. Verses 7 through 9. 2 John, verses 7 through 9. Uh, so John is concerned about his, his church here. And he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves and do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. For many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Well, so John here harkens back to a very familiar theme found in 1 John, that outside teachers are infecting the church with heretical doctrine, specifically, specifically Gnosticism, and he says that these are the antichrist. Um, so just to remind us, the Gnostics held that all matter, anything material, was innately evil, including all people. Flesh and blood is evil. Uh, so to the Gnostic, only the soul was good, and only the soul could be saved. The body was nothing except as a tool for evil. So to the Gnostics then, Jesus could not have been a man for all flesh and blood creatures are evil and Jesus as the Son of God could not be evil so they taught that Jesus did not come in the flesh but was a spirit sent by God well of course this strikes at the very heart of what it means to be Christian if Jesus was only a spirit then he could not die on the cross for me could not be tempted as all people are tempted or know what it means to suffer pain so the distance between God and humanity would remain. Further, the Gnostics would say, if the body was meant for evil and not to be saved, then whatever you do with the body is fine. It's condemned anyway. So be as sinful as you like with your body. Just make sure that your soul stays pure. Other than that, the Gnostics were all good people, right? You know, that's, that's how we, we judge folks, whether or not they're good people. Well, in 1 John, in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, uh, John makes a very strong point, very strong statement on verse 7's point here. Back in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets, those he calls deceivers in 2 John 7, Many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. 
This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and you have heard that is now already in the world. And so, basically the same thing that he's saying here in verse 7. Many deceivers have gone out into the world to do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So first, here in 1 John 4, John perhaps is remembering the singular truth that he gave us in his gospel back in the gospel of John chapter 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, uh, literally pitched his tent among us. Any spirit that denies that God's Son walked the earth in human form, John is saying, is a false spirit. Both those who deny the humanity of Jesus or those who deny the divinity of Jesus. The Gnostics denied that Jesus ever came in the flesh, claiming that he was just a spirit. Well, all other religions have some parallels to Christianity, but none can say the word became flesh. Without the humanity of Jesus, he cannot be the example that we are to follow. Without the humanity of Jesus, God cannot know our suffering or what it's like to be tempted. Uh, and, and Jesus cannot be our high priest. He cannot be our advocate. Without the humanity of Jesus, he cannot really be our savior, for he cannot spill his blood and die for my sins. Secondly, without the humanity of Jesus, there can be no physical resurrection of the dead. Because he was raised bodily from the grave, Jesus is able to promise that we too will be like him when we are raised. Without the humanity of Jesus, our bodies cannot be redeemed, can never be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Without the humanity of Jesus, Christ cannot stand in the gap, acting as a bridge between God and humanity. Without the humanity of Jesus, there can be no real salvation, no Christian faith. As William Barclay puts it, he had to become what we are to make us what he is. And so John is concerned here in 2 John that there are deceivers who do not acknowledge Christ is coming in the flesh. And this is the deceiver and the antichrist. And so he says in verse 8, Watch yourselves, watch yourselves, that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Watch yourselves. The church must be ever vigilant, ever on the alert, because the consequences of failure are catastrophic beyond words. The deceivers, John warns of, saw themselves as being progressive, as developing and taking the belief of the church up to the next level. And one of the common criticisms of the Greeks as a whole, um, as a whole e even by themselves, was that they were always so easily captivated by whatever was new. They thrilled at whatever was new. They, they wanted to hear the Apostle Paul in Athens, there in the book of Acts, because he was preaching something new. They, they can't, couldn't wait to hear something new. So here comes, for instance, say a slick new teacher from out of town. He's got a cool chariot and he's got a little Izod toga. He looks really sharp and he's declaring that he has a new revelation from God that takes the Christian faith to new heights of wonder. And they saw themselves as elevating the church. And John rightly saw it as destroying the church. Now, one of the things that we need to always ask is how is any of this relevant to today? This sounds like a first century church conflict. What possible connection does it have to today? Well, look around. Uh, at the next national meeting of the United Methodist Church, they are going to become the ununited Methodist Church. They are going to fracture in about five, maybe six different parts. Um, at the next meeting of the 
Episcopal Church, the next national meeting of the Episcopal Church, they too are going to have to deal with some very severe questions of survival. We all know that COVID has hurt every church across America, uh, but it has struck the Episcopal Church particularly hard. So as we're coming out of COVID across the country, the Episcopal Church in America's attendance is down by about a third. And it was already down uh, a lot from where they were as it is. And so they've got some very, very hard questions. But COVID is not just the reason. Um, virtually all of the mainline denominations in America are on life support. They have lost what they had accomplished. Well, why? You know, after World War II, for instance, uh, 1950, 51, 52, the United Methodist Church was the largest Protestant denomination in America. They were larger than Southern Baptist. Uh, Southern Baptist overtook them uh, in part because of the Southern Baptist emphasis on church planning, church starting as, as uh, communities began to grow across the United States, but also because of other issues within the United Methodist Church itself. Decades ago, progressives began coming into the church with new revelations and new teachings, uh, all designed to accommodate contemporary culture. And when I say decades, I mean going back to the 1920s, 1930s. Um, uh, Metaxas, uh, in his wonderful book on uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, talks about Bonhoeffer's time where he came over from the University of Berlin to Union University in New York. And Union was the preeminent university in America at the time. And uh, Metaxas has letters that he wrote, Bonhoeffer wrote back to his sister and to his family and friends back in Berlin going, I'm so disappointed by what I found here at Union. This was supposed to be the preeminent seminary uh, theological institution in the United States. And they're very liberal, but they can't explain why. Uh, they just know that they are. When you try to ask them why they believe the way that they believe, they can't really explain it. Their theology is so weak, so thin, and so indefensible, I'm, I'm just so disappointed by what I found. Um, as an aside, where he did find something that he wrote back to his family about, um, where he was so thrilled to be able to find what he called genuine Christian faith in America <clears throat> was an Abyssinian Baptist church, a uh, black church uh, in New York City uh, that um, uh, he began attending because it was the only church he could find where there was any Christianity. Um, and so we're talking going back a hundred years, when I say decades, back to the 1920s, 1930s, progressives begin coming into the church with these new revelation and new teachings designed to accommodate a more sophisticated, more scientific, more contemporary culture. But as one pundit has said, the mainline churches have bent over backwards so far to try to accommodate the culture they've fallen in. And there's a lot of truth in that. One can hardly tell in many of these churches, the difference between those churches and the lost culture that surrounds them. Uh, so in short, the battle that John was fighting is still the battle that we fight today. And here in verse 9 is a good point. He says, if anyone comes to you, I'm sorry, if any, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God, and the one who abides in his teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Anyone who goes too far. Anyone who goes too far. The Greek word is proagon, meaning to go on ahead. In other words, John is saying, beware of teachers and preachers who clearly have run ahead of Jesus. Uh, in your own life, when you get out too far in front of God, how's that work for you? It doesn't go well. It doesn't go well. When you get way out in front of God, you, you begin to have a, a problem. Um, and so when you go on ahead, when you run ahead of Jesus, instead of following after him, 
this is where the trouble starts. Um, you get these false teachers who claim to be progressive, they claim to be advanced in their thinking. Um, and you got to say that being progressive and advanced in one's thinking in and of itself is fine. The problem is, is when it gets ahead of Jesus and it breaks free of that tether that we have to Christ. Um, when I was um, little, uh, six years old, my, uh, my dad bought us a, uh, uh, a real, real nice bird dog. And this dog had a lot of energy. And dad said, here, I got a leash for the dog. You take the dog on a walk around the block. He yanked away from me. I couldn't, I couldn't control this dog for nothing. He weighed more than I did. And he just was bouncing everywhere and he yanked away from me and, um, uh, and got out into traffic. Well, that's what happens, right? When we get so far out ahead of God, when we are so bouncing, so excited, we know more than God does, and we yank away from God, that's where we get in trouble. It's where we get in trouble in our personal life. It's where we get in trouble in our, in our theology, in our philosophy, in our whole view of life. Um, and so uh, when we break free of that tether that we have to Christ, uh, this, is, this is where we get in trouble. And once we've broken away from Christ in his way, what we've, once we've gotten so far out ahead of him that we can't even see him behind us, we've broken away from God. We don't ever need to be running ahead of God. We need to be back behind him, back behind Jesus with our cross, following him. That's where we belong. That's where we need to be. That's where our life works. Um, and uh, when, we, when we get get out in front, get separated like that from him, is where our trouble starts. Paul had the same concern for the Corinthian church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, he said, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, uh, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I'm jealous of you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led away from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Um, another Jesus than the one that we preached to you, another gospel than the one that you've had. Um, you know, it's the same concern. Um, the people who say that they have this, this new revelation, this, this new insight about Jesus that the Bible didn't cover, you know? It's a new thing. Pay attention to what we've got, and we will take you so much higher. And so John says, look, anyone who goes too far, anyone who gets out in front of Jesus, who doesn't abide the teaching of Christ, who separated themselves, cut that tether. These do not have God. The one who abides in the teaching of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. So watch yourselves that you do not lose what you've accomplished, but that you may receive the full reward. And so we, we remain faithful to the end so that we do receive the reward that Christ has, has promised us. Um, if you go back and you look at the seven letters to the seven churches, in each one of these, there is a reward to the one who remains faithful. Um, in the letter to the church in Ephesus, in Revelation 2.7, uh, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Uh, to the church in Smyrna, it says, 
um, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. In verse 17, in the church of uh, Pergamum, uh, to him who overcomes, I will give him some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Um, in verse 26 of Revelation chapter 2, in the church, the, the letter to the church at Thyatira, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. To the church at Sardis, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before the Father, before his angels. Uh, to the church at Philadelphia, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar of the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. Verse 21, even the church at Laodicea, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. And I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So if we remain faithful, the Lord is, is waiting for us to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. There is a reward for remaining faithful. But the ones who go off, who get out in front of Jesus, who go apart from him, um, uh, you know, there, there is nothing but, but condemnation. This is the Antichrist, uh, John is saying. So for the true follower of Christ, Everything about us needs to be seen through the lens of Christ. Our thinking on science, philosophy, civics, uh, every aspect of life must be tied to the way, the truth, and the life of Christ. All else is weakness, lies, and death. As Christians, we are not free to believe whatever we choose. We are free to follow Christ, however he leads. Um, and I, I started by saying, in, in our thinking even of science, again, one of, the, one of the joys that I had in the 10 years that we were uh, there in, in Athens, Georgia, was being um, invited to um, uh, sit in with the Christian Faculty Forum. Um, basically 100 university professors most of them in the sciences, uh, and they would have some of the most amazing speakers come in. Uh, and <clears throat> at the University of Georgia, uh, the, uh, um, the professor who brings in more research dollars than anybody is a wonderful Christian man by the name of Fritz Schaefer. He's a physicist, and he's one of the top physicists in the nation. Um, and he'll just flatly tell you that there's no way that all of this could come into being without, without God. Um, uh, they brought in a um, wonderful uh, speaker from Rice University by the name of Dr. Jim Tour. Um, Dr. Tour is one of the world's leading experts on nanotechnology. Go look it up. <laughs> um, and he is one of the most amazing Christian disciples you'll ever see. And what one thing all of these guys agree on is that science doesn't make sense apart from God. Uh, without God, it just, it just can't make sense. Um, you know, you've got too many questions that will never be answered if God's not part of the equation. Um, and so whether you are a scientist, whether you are... Um, a politician, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, it doesn't matter. In your family life, in your civic life, in your professional life, whatever it is, everything we see or do is, is tempered, colored, dictated by our following the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, everything else is just weakness, lies, and death. Um, 
So we're not free as Christians to choose whatever we want to believe. Um, we are free to follow Christ wherever he leads, uh, to do whatever he commands, whatever else the world may say. Um, you know, that's, that was Paul's point. <laughs> you know, whether I'm going to follow the law or follow God, you know, you all decide, but I'm, I'm going to follow God. Um, so, um, so this is, this is what John's point is. Um, don't listen to these who want to tell you they've got something new, something beyond Jesus, because that is not the truth. It is the way to death and not life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for being with us. I thank you, Father, for your blessings and goodness. Uh, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your way, your truth, and your life. As we follow your way, Lord, life is so much easier, uh, makes so much more sense. As we follow your truth, we have the answers that the world is looking for. And as we follow in your life, Father, it is a joy and not a sorrow. Uh, it's, it's easy and not burdensome. And, and Lord, we just thank you. So, Father, be with us and bless us as we continue on the journey with you. Behind you, never in front of you. With our cross on our shoulder, following you each and every step of the way. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. 